Welcome to Forgotten Hollywood on Therapy Cable. Here is the Hollywood backstory. Stan Fries is, of all things, a tuba soloist and the recent talent casting and booking director with Disney Entertainment. Stan served in many roles throughout his Disney career, including the director of bands at both Walt Disney World and the Disneyland Resort. He has performed at the White House, the Kremlin, and along the Great Wall of China. He has appeared on The Lawrence Welk Show and Hee Haw. Recently retired from Disney, Stan Fries also overcame personal inner demons for a life well lived. He is the sound of Disneyland. Welcome to Forgotten Hollywood, streaming on the Therapy Cable Channel. Here's your host, Manny Pacheco. Welcome to Forgotten Hollywood on Therapy Cable. Of course, it's part of a franchise that includes an award-winning book series, a documentary currently in production, a radio show that airs weekly on 90.1 FM KBPK, and a blog site. Today's guest is Stan Fries. For 45 years, Stan has been a principal advisor and mentor for hundreds of Disney Entertainment Division staff members who are responsible for the music and show development for Disney theme parks around the world. Stan's most recent assignment was to find talent, develop music ensembles, and oversee the multitude of live musical performances at Disneyland, Disney California Adventure, and Downtown Disney. Welcome, Stan, to Thank Forgotten you. Hollywood. Nice to be here. It, it, as we said earlier, it is a life well lived, and, it, and it's based in Midwestern values. Can you tell us a little bit about where you, well, are, uh, you come from uh, and how it really gels well with the ideas of Adventureland, Frontierland, and, and Main Street USA at, at Disneyland? A lot of mine was Fantasyland. <laughs> <laughs> but that's for another show. That's right. Uh, well, to tell you the truth, you know, I mean, Walt being from the Midwest and all, uh, it, it's interesting because I'm from the Midwest. My parents are from Iowa. I grew up in Minnesota. So uh, I think one of the reasons that I got my original job with Disney as being the first leader of the Disney World Band when Disney World opened in 1971 was the fact that I had been a, an MC and performer around the Midwest. I kind of had that kind of, you know, chubby Midwest friendly looking guy that, you know, that you'd, that, that seemed to work well on a Disney property. Now you did it, you did it in a way that's not what you call, um, it's, it's not an easy road. You, you, you play a tuba. Right, I play a tuba, <laughs> and if it hadn't been for that, I probably would have never gotten where I was now. If I had played the trumpet, I'd just be another trumpet player. But the thing is, I on a dare, uh, when I was in fourth grade at my elementary school, and the band director came and showed all the different instruments to all of us kids, and we could pick an instrument that we wanted to play, my two friends bet me that I would uh, not take the tuba, so I took the tuba. And I made 50 cents that day. And back in 1954, that's a lot of money. So, took the tuba. My dad, being a band director, thought, oh, great, he's going to quit this in no time. I'm not going to, you know. Well, I didn't. And so, as a result, I became a tuba soloist. I kind of didn't, I wasn't aware of the things you shouldn't be doing on the tuba. So, I did them all. And uh, played country, played all sorts of stuff on the tuba which was kind of like having a second belly button, you know, it's like so big deal. So you play country, but the, the, the neat thing was that uh, it was different enough that it was embraced and, uh, and it caught the attention, of, caught the attention of, of Disney. And, and, and before that, even like Lawrence Well, right. The white house, uh, tra travels around the world. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, what happened was that I was, uh, the minister of culture, uh, decided that they wanted the Minnesota Wind Ensemble to reopen the cultural exchange program between the Soviet Union and uh, the United States. And the Minister of Culture came here on a tour and looked at all sorts of different soloists, blah, 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 blah. Chose me. <laughs> so because, once again, Russia had never, the Soviet Union had never had a tuba soloist before. So it was like, you know, a two-headed monster. They thought this is going to be great. And it turned out to be great for me. And, uh, and uh, 
back then, Disney was following this. It became kind of a halfway big story over there. Not me, but this whole reopening of the cultural exchange program. And as a result, Disney kind of followed it in bits and pieces, this two-month tour. And then uh, about halfway through, the White House called and said, this has been so successful. Uh, we were in the Soviet Union at the time. They said, would you come and do a command performance for, for President Nixon and Kissinger and Dobrynin on your way back? in the Rose Garden. We said, yes, naturally. So <laughs> once again, Disney kind of peripherally, somebody saw me do that. And as a result, when I got back uh, later on, I got a call saying we're opening a theme park in Orlando. Would you be interested in coming down as a tuba player? I said, yeah. So, um, but before that could happen, I was already made, the, after conversation and after knowing I was a conductor and an MC. Uh, I went from directly only a week playing the tuba down there to the conductor of the band. Right. So I was the first full-time band director of the Disney World Band in 71, pretty much as a result of being a tuba player first. Was part of that because you were a tuba player? And and I would say another part of that, and I think folks will get that in, in our, the sense of our conversation, is that you are also got this wonderful personality that really f gels well with the idea of what Disney's all about. The idea that you you're, you're you seem to be very happy-go-lucky. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, that's the result of a lot of things. <laughs> but uh, I mean, a yeah, good personality much. also pays well when you're in front of an audience. Here's the deal. And I never take myself any more seriously than I have to to do a good job. And I tell uh, kids that, you know, don't take yourself seriously and just have fun with everything you do because life's too long. Yeah, you know, <laughs> not really, too short. It's, yeah, it's too, it's long, too long in my estimation. So you better be having fun and, uh, uh, you know, and not take yourself seriously and not work in a culture of fear, but just let it all hang out and have a great time and be honest. You became kind of the embodiment at Disneyland of what really Main Street is all about. Looking back at, at, at an earlier time, a simpler time, uh, and you let a band of extraordinarily talented folks. How did you assemble all of these individuals? Because I think that was part of your job, wasn't it? Yeah, for sure. And it has been for the last 40 some years is finding the different instrumentalists right. uh, for all the parks that have done this in Japan and you know, blah, blah, blah. But, well, <laughs> you know what? First of all, it's a good job. It's right. a good job for the musicians because they're done at six o'clock at night. They can go work another job. Uh, but where do you find these? <clears throat> Florida, it was a job. That was a struggle. Right. Uh, because not everybody wants to move down to Orlando. Matter of fact, what happened was that uh, after we got the park, the park up and going, after about eight months, I'd lost a good deal of that band down there because they went, wait a minute. It rains every day here. It's 100 degrees. There's bugs. And big alligators, bugs. Big bugs, big alligators. <laughs> and, you know, we don't like marching around in all this heat and humidity. So I had to then restock that band. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I did was to go, the perfect employee for a Disney park would be a musician from one of the service bands in D.C., and so I went to D.C. And because found, of the humidity? And no, be, these well, because they're, they're great players. Okay. They're used to having their hair cut all the time. Okay. They're used to keeping their costumes clean and fresh in their uniform. Uh, they're used to playing in the rain or whatever else. And they're really good players. So I, I got a number of players from the service bands out of D.C. And then just uh, word of mouth, I'd go audition people or... They would come down to Orlando and audition. So it was it was harder down in Florida than here. Here, there's thousands of great musicians. So my job at Disneyland in California is pretty simple. Now, did you work with Walt Disney directly no, initially? Never did. Okay. No, he he had passed uh, before I started. I started in '71. Okay. So, but Walt Disney World was created around that time in '71 because he yes. had already he had already started the the plans of that For before sure. he had before right. he had passed. Yep, on. yep, and that opened uh, in 1971 mm -hmm. in Orlando. Mm -hmm. So and he passed in '66. And you had to live in you had to live in in Orlando. Yes, too. yep. Now yep. tell us a little bit about some of the, the 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 fun stories that would happen down there while you were working at Disney. World. Oh well, first of all, when you're working with professional musicians of which my grandparents and parents and me and my kids all are. So I have great respect for them. 
Uh, and at the same time, there's a lot of good fun stories with all of that, you know. Uh, one, of, one of my short examples of the reason most good musicians have a great sense of humor is they start playing when they're in fourth grade. They practice by themselves in a practice room all the way through junior high. They really get great. Now they buy have to buy expensive instruments. They practice more. They're in the band. They dedicate at least half their day to their music, either practicing at home or in the band. And they finally go to college. They buy a lot of expensive, if, if right. you're a woodman player. And now you get so good that finally you're a professional and you get to go play at, the, at a hotel where they tell you, Oh, by the way, don't mingle with uh, with the guests and don't use the bar. Uh, you know, you know. So, like, you're after all of that, a great intellect, a lot of money spent. You're now a second class citizen in the eyes of a lot of people in America. Not so much that way in Europe. So you have a choice. You can either go, and so that's where we kind of developed a sense of humor about the whole thing um, and about life. Mm -hmm. But you can either do that or you can be a grumpy old man and shoot up with heroin and try and forget about all that. And so, you know, the, the strong survive and they get a good sense of humor out of it and what have you. So. And when I've seen photos of you and I've actually seen motion early motion pictures of you, I mean, you remind me a lot of, of the final scene of, of Robert Pe Preston in The Music Man. I think a that, lot of energy, a lot of, uh, a lot of showmanship. Yeah. Oh, that's all about showmanship. Yeah, well, not all about, but that's a big deal. You know, I mean, these people have come through the front gates and paid good money to be entertained, to have fun, you know. And so if you got some grumpy looking band up there, you know, <laughs> it's not going to get it after they spent that much money on the tickets. So and, you get, and you get a chance to work with a lot of the characters, Mickey Mouse oh, for and, sure. and, and, and yeah. uh, Alan and Dale and then yeah. Snow White and, yeah. and then the whole life. <laughs> yeah. What's that like? Well, Alan and Dale was really something. Chip and Dale was a different story. Uh, oh, Chip and, maybe yeah, it was Chip and yeah, Dale. Chip maybe. And Dale. I, I, yeah. Well, you know, the, the okay. two Chipmunks. So I did work in Chip and Dale's for a while, but that's... Not, not, no, not, that's, not oh, Chip yeah, and Dale. Nails, it's another story. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyhow, yeah, I mean, you know, you get that. It, I, I remember my first week at Disney World writing back to my parents saying, I'm having lunch and playing poker with Winnie the Pooh, <laughs> you know, on a break. And I said, you know, who would have ever thought that it came to this? Right. You know, but, it, but it's all, you drink the Kool-Aid and you just have a great time working with the characters and fun people and one of the things that I've noticed about and I've been to Disney World and of course here mm -hmm. at, at Disneyland in Orange County uh, the idea that the children are children the wide-eyed they're, mm -hmm. they're they're they they're really happy they're, they 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 see the imaginative uh, possibilities but even the even the adults become children and and you help create that here's what I tell people I spent years in town square watching the guests come through the gate and watching the hippest of the hip pay a hundred dollars or whatever it is to be corny and have fun to put on mickey mouse ears so you see you know movie stars and rock stars coming through there all of a sudden skipping down main street with a mickey mouse hat on because they want to really have fun and be a kid so we, you help create that. Yeah. And, but you know what? We don't dare ever out hip ourselves. You know, sometimes I think that it's been part of my job to, to make sure that we don't get too sophisticated in some of what we present and too hip, uh, at least in the town square area and Main Street. We keep that pretty much, hey, this is fun. It's balloons, it's popcorn, it's Mickey Mouse. And uh, yeah, I, I, I bought into that. I had fun doing that. And I had fun watching these real hip people turn into 12-year-olds, you know? <laughs> so you don't want to disappoint them, you know? We're going to take a quick break, but before I do, I want to ask you one last question. And that is, tell us about how you get the mindset right for the band that you hire. Because you have to hire a certain type of individual who will actually uh, see your vision and see the vision of Walt Disney. Yep. Totally, because if they don't, first of all, they'll they'll wipe out themselves. They'll say, I just don't want to put this funny hat on, this straw hat, and play Bill Bailey. But so when I'm hiring a musician, that's totally an important facet of it. I have to know that these people are kind of the fun, 
they don't take themselves too seriously, but they also have to be great players. Oftentimes, the two don't go together. Right. Sometimes the really, really studious, great intellectual jazz players to, uh, playing John Coltrane don't want to play Bill <laughs> Bailey, you know? And so that's fine, totally fine. A lot of my friends could no more work at Disneyland than fly to the moon, and I love them dearly as people. But I have to look for entertainers and musicians that actually have fun getting out there and bending over with a little kid and playing, you know, in their ears on the trumpet or letting a, a little kid beat on the drum. You know, they have to get into that and enjoy doing that. Otherwise, you know, I, I got to tell you, I've work. had conversations with many folks. I've never had an individual who would compare or at least in the same sentence mention John Coltrane and Bill Bailey in the same sentence. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. There's two factions of people that are going to hate you. <laughs> you know, we're going to be right back with more of Stan Fries and a life well lived. And we're going to talk a little bit about his career outside of Disneyland, which includes a stint at Hee Haw when we return on Forgotten Hollywood. What is more important in Orange County than Disneyland? That's it. That is the most important thing. And Disneyland is nothing without music. And the music at Disneyland is nothing without Stan Freeze. Our next guest is here because he's one of this nation's finest tuba players. And uh, I understand he plays country tuba. Would you welcome Mr. Stan Freeze? When you think of the tuba, we think of our dad, but when you really think about like a quintessential tuba player, the big, huge dude, and the, you know, it's like, it's, it's so not my dad. My dad's like, hey, how's it going? I, I think bass is more kind of his style, even though he never really did it. He's like the flea of tuba. <laughs> well, after a while, I ran out of air. I I better get out of there. I think if you're going to choose the tuba, first of all, you know, there's something a little off. Who wants to carry that thing to school every day? Who wants to blow in that big mouthpiece? It takes a special individual. And, but if you're going to play the tuba, you know, be the best. <laughs> Hello, my name's Matt, and I'm an addict. My mom was addicted to prescription pills when I was very young, before I even turned one. Are you or someone you know struggling with alcohol or drug addiction? Has everyone given up on you or your loved one? The caring staff at Elite Care understands and treats you as a whole person. We offer individual and group therapy, holistic healing such as yoga, nutrition, and spirituality medication management, and PTSD treatment. By building upon your strengths and rebuilding broken bonds, we help you begin a successful life. With our staff of licensed psychotherapists and doctors, you can be assured of the highest level of care. Elite Care is the best option for long-term rehabilitation from drugs and alcohol. Contact 888-511-0607 for more information. Welcome back to Forgotten Hollywood. I'm Manny Pacheco, and we're here with Stan Freeze. And you really are the sound of Disneyland. And that, and this is not something that I created. This is something that, in speaking to folks at Disneyland, they are really happy to use that moniker on you. The that's sound very nice. of Disneyland, isn't that? That's isn't that really, really nice. Yeah, thing? I think I, I don't know if that's a calliope or a, <laughs> <laughs> or a harmonica, a harmonica, but definitely a tuba, a banjo. Yeah, the tuba, yeah. But you're also a songwriter, and it led to uh, it led to some pretty interesting uh, visits, including a stop with Hee Haw, and of course the great Roy Clark, who absolutely is as talented as they come. Oh, for sure. I got a whole new respect for the Nashville musicians after being down and doing that. Well, here's what happened. Three months before I turned 40 years old, I realized I'd recorded every kind of music that you could on the tuba, uh, I mean, basically, you know, symphonic and, and small brass groups and brass bands and Dixieland or whatever. But I hadn't done any country. And I thought, well, man, what am I going to do? I got to record a country tune before I turn 40. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll implode. I don't know why that, 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 I know. that became important, but it became yeah. part of the bucket Otherwise, list. I'm going to shoot myself. <laughs> okay, so uh, I thought, well, I don't know anything about country. So I 
thought about it a while and ended up writing a funny country tune about a symphony tuba player that's on the way to a symphony job with his tuba and he gets lost and he has to stop into a redneck bar to ask for directions. And he walks in and like the old westerns of the 40s and 50s, they would shoot at the at the cowboy and make him dance, you know. Well, here, these big thug cowboys made the tuba player play country music. That was that was what that was his version of having the tap dance. <laughs> so I wrote this whole thing about that, and um, and it was funny, and uh, so I recorded it with some just marvelous musicians, uh, country players, uh, the demo. And I went in and played it for my boss the next day. We recorded at Jose Feliciano's recording studio in Orange County. And I came in the next day and played it for my boss, Sonny Anderson at the time. And he said, man, this is great. He said, I got to play this for Sam Lovello. I said, who's Sam Lovello? He said, he produces Hee Haw. He used to do the Jonathan Winter show. And then he used to do the Smothers Brothers. And now he's doing Hee Haw. So I said, okay, great. So we went up to, uh, he had to be meeting with Sam LaBello about something else. And at that time, uh, Young Street Productions was in Hollywood or Beverly Hills. We went up there. He introduces me. And at the end of their business meeting between Sam LaBello and Sonny Anderson, Sonny says, hey, Stan would like to play you this little thing that he wrote. So, you know, country tunes are all about the lyrics. So They tell a story. They tell a story. And right. what's, that's why I love writing country. You got three minutes to begin a thought, develop a thought, and get out of the thought. And so it's a challenge. So uh, so we're sitting there, and, and we turn this thing on, the sound system in Sam's office, and about a third of the way through, Sam Lavello stands up and walks over to a calendar, a big calendar on the wall. <laughs> and I'm so mad in my mind, I'm going, doggone it, you know, He's supposed to be listening. This is a funny thing. And now he's blowing it. He doesn't care. He's up scribbling on the wall. And he's missing my funny story. So the, the whole song was over. And the minute it was over, and I'm just steaming, he goes, okay, I need you in Nashville this day, this day, this day, this day. He was marking out the days on the calendar right. that I was going to be on. He, he had already made a decision. He'd already, right off the bat, he'd made a decision. Right. So he said, uh, well, what kind of tuba do you have? I said, well, it's a handmade German. But he said, no, stop. He said, you got to find an old silver sousaphone that's real beat up looking, and but plays well. <clears throat> so I did. I found one that was beat up. I had it play well. Went down to Nashville, and that started the deal. And after that, for the next 10 years, I could be on that show as many times as I could write a funny song about the tuba. About how many songs did you end up writing? Man, I said, well, some, some we, we taped that thing every six months. Some six months uh, series, I didn't have time to do it. Too busy at Disney. So I said, golly, I don't even know, 10, 12, Wow, that's 14, a, but that's a lot of appearances. 14, then. yeah. And, uh, but Roy Clark was a tuba player. He was a lot of things, yeah. including a tuba and player. And so yeah. was Charlie McCoy, who was the world's greatest country harmonica player. Right. So they already had kind of an affinity for the tuba uh, and thought it was funny, you know. So, uh, so that was the deal. I could just be on there as many times as we could do that. And Roy and I would do some funny stuff. And like you say, Roy is a consummate player, musician, as was Glenn Campbell, as was, you know, all of those people I got to meet and play with, Chet Atkins. Buck Owens. Yeah, it? yeah, of all of those guys, consummate players. I mean, wow. Unbelievable. And, 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 and Disney didn't mind that you were working at both. Uh... Yeah, here's the great thing. I wouldn't tell Disney. Oh. <laughs> Well, they had to know no. you were on television. Um, yeah, but here's the funny thing. I knew I didn't have to tell them because no one would admit they watched Hee Haw. And that's what happened. Seriously, no one. And so I totally nobody said anything to me. Some of the people, I'm sure, saw it. And but like I say, just didn't want to. The ratings it. were through the roof on Hee Haw. I know, but the Disney people were too hip for that. So they, I knew I wouldn't get in trouble. And my boss, Sonny, was all for it. He was. He thought it was great that I was doing that. He was the president of the uh, Country Music Association for a while. Mm -hmm. And um, so he had a, a love for country music. And then, so they just let me do that. Now, I'll tell you a funny one. So I'm walking out of the Disneyland band uh, room uh, in the administration building one day, and I've got my band leader outfit on. And here comes a painter across the parking lot walking up to me, and he had two big 10-gallon buckets full of paint. He'd been painting, and he had the white you know, the white shirt and the white pants, white shoes. He was a painter, painter stuff. And he stopped and said, excuse me. And I said, yeah. He says, um, are you Stan Freeze? I said, yeah. He said, were you ever on Hee Haw? I said, yeah. 
He said, thank God. And he wasn't laughing. I said, well, what are you talking about? He said, well, I had OD'd and I was in Anaheim Memorial Hospital. And my roommate had hee-haw on. And when I awoke, I looked up and I heard Roy Clark say, and from Disneyland, here's Stan Freeze. He said, I thought I'd burned out all of my brain. And, it, it, you know, and he, he said, I thought I was freaking out. So I, I said, no, I said, that's a funny story. Yeah, it is, you know, so uh, then, then get this. So he just picks up his paint and just walks off. He didn't say, you were great, you were bad, <laughs> see you later. He just said, do you hurry around there? Oh, thank God. Okay, see you later. He made his point and he, he, made his and point. he moved He was on. so happy that, I, uh, yeah. You know, be, funny. Be, working with Disneyland, working with Hee I mean, you, you really had some, uh, you, you, had a, you had an arduous schedule. And sometimes that can lead to uh, demons. And we're on here on Therapy Cable. But, but somehow, Disney has been your salvation for, in many in oh, ways. Well, first of all, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm talking to one of the kids on my team at Disney one day, and he said, uh, Sam, when you were born? When were you born? I said, 1944. He said, 44. I said, when were you born? He said, uh, 1987. So he says, uh, what were you doing in 1987? I said, well, I was in jail. <laughs> I was in St. Joseph's Rehab <laughs> oh Hospital. God. You know, I mean, it, it's funny, but the point of the matter is, yeah, um, I... I checked myself into alcohol rehab in 1987 or 88, 87. And uh, that began my march through sobriety. And it's what saved my life. But in the meantime, now back then it wasn't hip to go into chemical rehab. It was before Betty Ford. Two or years, yes. Yeah. Two years later, every rock star in the world is in right. rehab. 1987, I went in, man, you didn't talk about it. And so, but, so... Working at Disney gave me, because I'd lost everything, man. I hit bottom, you know, blah, 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 blah. But working at Disney and being able to say I worked at Disney gave me some dignity to my life that I really needed at a time when I didn't feel I had any dignity. So, uh, so yeah, for sure, for me, like uh, Anaheim, here's an example. Anaheim High School asked me to come and speak that first year at their Red Ribbon Day about alcohol rehab. So I went and talked to the president, or, uh, the vice president of the entertainment division at the time. He said, hey, they've asked me to come to Anaheim High School speak. He said, well, okay, that's okay. Just don't tell them you work at Disney. And I went, so that, that crushed me. But not only that, it shows you what people thought about checking yourself into rehab in 1987. Right. 1990... I would have been in there with Johnny Depp and every movie star. Well, not Johnny Depp. <laughs> but no, you know no, I, mean? I, but yeah. I know what you mean. But every hip, you know. Yeah. So, and that's another thing, uh, uh, another bone that I have to pick with the anonymous part of alcohol, uh, Holocaust Anonymous, and one reason I'm not anonymous, because if I'd have known how many people that I admired and respected were in Alcoholics Anonymous, I'd have checked in years earlier. Right. But... I didn't know, and so I finally just had to man up and walk in on my own. Then I found out. So I tell everybody about it, totally tell everybody about it. And then the turnaround led to uh, you mentoring young young folks, and and not only not not with the issue of alcohol related issues, mm -hmm. but I mean bringing in young folks, uh, bringing in talent to Disneyland, and and gearing them the right way. I mean, you've really been a yeah. You, you've you've actually been like. If, if, forgive the phrase, a father figure to these folks. Well, here's the deal. I've always looked at my job as building the world's greatest karma because I have the opportunity and the karmic responsibility to give good employment to deserving musicians. At any age. At any age. At any age, totally. So my job, I felt I'll never get fired because God loves me. <laughs> because because I'm doing a good job coming from a good place, giving the great people attitude. that have the God-given talent, yeah. you know, I mean, it's there's something spiritual about that, as corny as that sounds. But I'm able to, if I see a real deserving musician that's really good, I, I get to figure out a way to hire him, you know, in many cases. And you've hired, uh, you've actually had an all-female rock band. You've I'm had, big you, on women's groups because... Historically, every not just Disney, but I mean, uh, everywhere, women have a tough time uh, breaking in, the glass in, ceiling. Break, yeah, breaking that ceiling in right. professional music. 
Not so much anymore, but in the in the past it was. So I made sure that I've got. I started with the first all girl rock and roll band there back in the way back in the nineties. They uh, that I called Misbehaving. Uh, M I S S. Yeah, Mis right. Mis yeah. yeah. I, I, I helped start the, uh, and get going at Disney the Mariachi Divas, all female. They've won two Grammys, by the way. Mariachi band, all girls. Uh, Another all-girl rock and roll band I called the Suffragettes. So just, and I've made three or four girls leaders of groups because they're great players. They're great musicians and they're great leaders. They have leader Good quality. role models. Yeah. yeah. So just because they're female, you know, doesn't mean that they shouldn't have that those opportunities. So I have been, and I've gotten criticism for it, you know. Uh, some people look a little askew, but big deal, man, you know. Uh and I, I, I brought the first girl into the Disneyland band. And, uh, you know, so that's, that's, and I did that because my mom was such a great role model. Right. My mom was five foot two, captain of the college basketball team. <laughs> and she majored in Greek. Five foot two and a yeah, basketball. Oh right. my gosh. You know, so she was a smart cookie. You recently retired. Who is going to replace Stan Freeze? Oh, man. At, at Disneyland, you yeah, recently retired. Yeah, 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 I did. You know what? Uh, there's a lot of people are absorbing kind of what I did, so it's going to work. It's going to work, and I'll I'll be there as a friendly voice on the other end. But of you've home. left such a huge footprint. Yeah, but, yeah, and that's been good. It, you know, I mean, I've been lucky that I did leave that footprint. It's mm -hmm. all been a total blessing for me. Total, man, a drunk tuba player from Minneapolis, and all of a sudden, <laughs> you know. <laughs> So it has been just the best. Well, before we say goodbye, I also want to mention that your your children, your your sons, are quite talented and, and in the music industry and in AA. Oh. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> but they're but they're very talented and yeah. and they oh, yeah. and they've got their names on some very important oh, uh, yeah. music. Oh for sure, for sure. I mean, you know, Jason uh, started with Joe Walsh, right, and Jewel. He and uh, big names, yeah, yeah, and then Goo Goo Dolls, and now he's been with Green Day the past 12 years playing keyboards. Uh, and Josh, Guns N' Roses, Nine Inch Nails, uh, Sublime, Sting, A, A listers, yeah, A listers, and uh, they're both great musicians, what a pedigree, yeah, great musicians and great guys. And they say alcoholism is a family disease. It kind of is, you know. So I'm proud of the fact that they're both, you know, turned their lives around that way. Not that they were in the toilet, but they saw that it was a problem and they quit, you know, they quit. Well, it sounds so. to me like you have really done what you've done best, which is to display an amazing amount of grace. And with that, let's watch you sing Amazing Grace. Oh, play it, you mean? Well, I'll play it. Yeah, okay, right. That's right. That's you wouldn't right. want to hear me sing it. No. <laughs> okay, let's watch it. It wouldn't be so graceful. It's second nature. A lot of people have to learn it. Or as Stan likes to say, it's in his DNA. There's no second place. There's no almost Stan Freeze. We feel like Stan is the is a father figure to all of us, especially to me. He appreciates everyone. He's you know a comrade, a cohort. He's somebody you can just call for a good laugh. Somebody you can stop by and just chat and see what's going on in the world. So so loving. I mean, when you go to one of his parties and you see the cast of characters that he's adopted, and yeah, I guess I'm one of them. <laughs> My dad is the music man. Thank you, Stan Fries, for joining us. I, Thank you, I, man. I, I could probably speak with you for another hour. Your stories are remarkable. Uh, your relationship with Disneyland is fascinating. Uh, I think uh, anybody can relate to the Magic Kingdom. And thank you for joining us on Forgotten Hollywood at, on Therapy Cable. And remember, let's never forget, I'm Manny Pacheco. <laughs>